Hello, beautiful soul tribe, and thank you for joining today. I'm feeling so, so grateful and blessed because today I've had the opportunity to come out to the beautiful Glasshouse Mountains, my first trip out here, to get to have a bit of a chat with Anne Osborne, who is a fruitarian of the last 30 years. She raised both her kids on a fruitarian diet and has so much knowledge in this area through her own experiences and she's a research fanatic and <laughs> just an amazing human all around so thank you so much for coming on the podcast and thank you very much for inviting me and um, glad you got to come out to the glass house mountains yes yeah. yes very exciting well obviously when most people hear that you've been a fruitarian for 30 years they're like what how did you how did you live on fruit for that long of a period of time and what made you decide to do those things? And obviously myself being so new to the fruitarian yeah. kind of world when we compare it, especially to 30 years. Um, yeah, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your story and, and how you transitioned to living this way. Yeah, so my story really starts off when I was 20 and I was at university and I decided I was already vegetarian for ethical reasons. And I really was uncomfortable with a lot of the practices in the dairy industry and the egg industry. And I kind of knew that I needed to go vegan. And I'd sort of been clinging on to the vegetarian diet a bit because I really like cheese. And <laughs> I thought, no, ethically, I can't do this anymore. So purely for ethical reasons, <laughs> I decided to become vegan overnight to give up all remaining animal products and at the time I was at university and where I lived was at the bottom of a hill and the university campus was on the top of a hill so every day I had to climb this hill to get to university and I thought I was pretty fit you know I was 20 years old had no major health issues but every time I got to the top of the hill I would be tight in the chest and I would be wheezy mm. and the very next day after I gave up all animal products it was so I really noticed it because it really was the very next day I was at the top of the hill and I thought I'm at the top of the hill I'm not wheezing <laughs> yeah I've not got that tightness in my chest and I thought wow wow I was doing this purely for ethical reasons mm. wasn't expecting or wasn't even thinking about any health improvement and yet here I am at the top of the hill and I'm not wheezing and so from that moment on that was like a revelation really that was a turning point in my life because I'd never really thought there was a connection between what we ate and how we felt yeah. because when you're relatively young and you're relatively healthy you take your health for granted and from that moment on I was really interested to find out more about different types of vegan diet so I tried an Anne Wigmore vegan diet which is a lot of sprouts wheatgrass that kind of thing mm. and I tried a whole food like regular vegan diet and I tried a macrobiotic vegan diet and all of them I felt pretty good on but not that good that I stuck at any one of them for more than about 18 months mm. and then in um, 1990 I was part of an animal rights group in the UK in Leicester, which is my hometown. And we had a speaker. We had various speakers. And one of the speakers we had was a guy called David Shelley. Mm -hmm. And he was a fruitarian. And he just looked terrific. He had such good energy. And a, he just glowed. And he cycled everywhere. And he was so enthusiastic. And I thought, whatever he's doing is working really well for him. And he'd yeah. written a book. Um, and I read his book. And it all made sense. And a whole group of us, we were all like vegan for ethical reasons. We all thought, yes, you know, yeah. we, we want to, you know, some of what he's got. And we want to give it a go. And I was pregnant at the time with my eldest son. So I did more of a transitional period because I thought I'm pregnant. I don't want to do any huge elimination. Yeah. But I think I never really got any elimination because I think over those four years between discovering David Shelley and becoming vegan, I'd gradually been refining my diet. Mm. I'd cut out white flour, I'd cut out sugar. I'd cut out, you know, a lot of products. And even when I was on the Anne Wigmore, the macrobiotic, the whole food vegan diets, it was still basically whole foods. Mm. You know, when I cooked, it would be from scratch with organic ingredients. So I think I'd been gradually getting rid of a lot of yeah. the toxic stuff and also having a lot of organic, you're minimizing a lot of chemicals in your food. And so I did this transitional period where I'd eat more and more fruit, less and less cooked whole foods until at the end of the transitional period, which was about a year, I was on like a whole 
fruitarian diet and that transitional period was very useful to me and some of the sort of the founders of the fruitarian diet like Essie Honnable and Arnold Eric both mm. of them said how important a transitional diet can be to get you ready Mm. Essie Honorable herself, she was a South African and she had very serious health issues. So she didn't bother with the transitional period because she would have probably died if she hadn't changed her diet. But she said afterwards it was so, so hard and it can be very hard for a lot of people. Yeah. So during the transitional diet, I found what worked for me. I found that I could do like three months just on fruit. And then I'd do a period where I'd just have some cooked food in the evening. So maybe a baked potato or a baked sweet potato which so so it was simple nothing you know fancy nothing complicated but even with that amount of cooked food I noticed that my body odor changed and I didn't feel quite as good and when I woke up in the morning I had a different taste in my mouth so that transitional period for me showed me that for me personally 100% raw fruitarian diet was the most effective yeah. diet and that's not the case for everybody I think it's really important that everybody finds what works for them yeah some people do really well 80% raw others 90% raw some people 70% raw so it really just depends on what works for you yeah. but I did find that transitional period very useful and then I've just stuck with it and it's stuck with me ever since because I can't think of any other diet I've tried various types of vegan diet and I will always be vegan for ethical reasons that worked as well because a lot of the diets they have grains in or mm. foods that have got high in sodium or more processed and I just feel better on the fruit diet and you know I've had two pregnancies one in transition and one fully on after I'd been fruitarian for 12 years and what was interesting was that my body recovered so much better after my second pregnancy yeah even though I was 12 and a half years old when I gave birth wow um my I lost all the weight like within a couple of days how old were you when you had your second pregnancy 37 wow um Amazing. lost all the weight like straight the weight and also I found that my stomach with my first pregnancy when I was still eating some um cooked vegan foods it took a long time to go back to yeah. normal I mean it, it is changed a bit when you've had a baby but to go <laughs> flat and um, I was just expecting that with a second pregnancy because I thought, well, I'm 12 and a half years older. You know, my body's that much older. But it was like the next day my stomach was flat. Obviously, it's not got the same tone because you've had a baby in there. But <laughs> it, was, it was flat the next day. And I, I took a picture where I got someone to take a picture because I was thinking, you know, this is like crazy. Yeah. Well, so my body recovered even though I was older yeah. with being on the fruit diet. And I think what is really important for me is getting good quality foods, mm. good quality fruit. Mm -hmm. because to me it's not so much whether you're eating greens or greens and fruit but the bottom line is always the quality oh, yeah. because if you've got a really good quality mamesa poti that's been grown on an old tree it's been left to fully ripen it's fallen off mm -hmm. you just pick it up and it's sun warmed and you eat that that is going to have more mineral content and more micronutrients than greens that have been grown hydroponically and kept in a fridge for a week yeah, so, so the bottom line for me it's always the quality of that individual, whether it's a greens or whether it's fruit. Mm. And I think a danger can be looking at chronometer for your micronutrient yeah. needs. You can look and say, look, I've had this amount and this amount and this amount. And yes, I'm getting all my amounts of calcium. I'm getting all my amounts of copper, manganese, whatever. But the thing, the flaw with chronometer is it's based on averages. So for mm. macronutrients, you know, proteins, carbohydrates and fats, it's pretty accurate. But for micronutrients, it could be well out because, for yeah. instance, if they say um, one orange has 50 milligrams of calcium in it, they've taken 10 oranges and they've added all the amounts together and divided it by 10 to get an average. So yeah. one orange might have been biodynamically grown, um, really good soil, lots of soil prep. Um, and another orange might have been grown with a lot of chemicals, picked underripe and kept in cold storage. So one orange might have had 125 milligrams of mm, calcium. Mm -hmm. The other might have had 12. Yeah. So the bottom line always for making sure your micronutrient needs are met, which are minerals, vitamins and antioxidants, is getting the best quality produce. Yeah. And that includes as much organic or non-sprayed, wild, foraged, homegrown, neighbours grown it as yeah. possible. 
And one reason, because some people say, oh, there isn't that much difference between organic and chemically grown food. I noticed the taste (laughs) so much. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Yeah, but one really, really important thing is the soil. Yeah. Now, the soil is a beautiful sort of like microcosm of life. And it is killed for many, many monocrops and many chemical um, farming practices. They kill the soil. Yeah. Because to have micronutrients in your fruit, you need microorganisms in the soil. And the way it works is a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Yeah. And I think symbiotic relationships are what makes the planet go round as well as love, <laughs> but symbiotic relationships. Yeah. And so all these microorganisms in the soil help out the fruit trees. So especially the fungi or the mycelium. So the mycelium often live on the tree roots and they break down certain bonds. For instance, in calcium phosphate, you can put a lot of calcium in your soil. You can put lime in the soil, calcium phosphate, whatever, Mm -hmm. but the tree itself cannot break those bonds down. So for instance, there was a avocado farmer in New South Wales. He put 1.5 tons of lime which is a calcium Mm -hmm. you know um additive to the soil per hectare on his on his avocado plantation and there were still no appreciable levels of assimilable calcium in the soil or Mm -hmm. in the fruit Mm -hmm. because the person who had farmed before had put chemicals in the soil which had killed the fungi so you can put lots and lots of calcium in your soil but if you haven't got the fungi you can't get those bonds broken down so basically the the fungi break down those inaccessible chemical bonds which allows the trees to assimilate the calcium Mm -hmm. and other minerals but particularly calcium and that's what you know as raw vegans we're looking to get our calcium needs met (laughs) and the symbiotic part of the relationship it is that the fungi can't photosynthesize because photosynthesis produces carbohydrates, which is food for plants. But fungi don't have leaves and you need leaves and to absorb sunlight to photosynthesize. So in exchange for breaking down the bonds, the tree passes carbohydrates to the fungi. So So it's beautiful. So when Mm. we've got good soil, when we've got soil that's not been tilled or disturbed or there's not chemicals put on it, then we get this wonderful microcosm that's going on with all these microorganisms, which allow the food to have good you know mineral content in it because the bonds yeah. have been broken down so one important aspect of having organic or biodynamic or wild food is that it's going to be higher in calcium and other minerals because yeah. the microorganisms haven't been killed any farming practice like strawberries or even like avocados are sprayed a lot around the trees anything that uses a lot of chemicals the microorganisms will be killed mm. and the mineral levels will be a lot lower. So it's really, really important. So, you know, there's kind of key points to thriving mm. on this diet long term and thriving, not just sort of getting by, but feeling yeah. really good and getting old and still being able to do everything you want to do. If you want to go and run for like five miles in the morning, you can go and run for five miles. You've not got aches and yeah. pains. Um, and you have a less of a tendency to get injured because, you know, you're giving your body the nutrients, nutrients it needs yeah. to, um, you know, be safe. Um, so getting good quality produce is really important. Being prepared for the diet, yeah. being prepared mentally, mm. physically and emotionally. And the <laughs> transition diet can really help with that. Yeah. So I'd say being prepared, accessing really good quality fruit. And the third thing would be having faith Mm. in the diet yeah and i don't mean blind faith i don't mean me saying right i'm going to be on a fruitarian diet for 30 years now and that's it <laughs> it's like no Off you go <laughs> yeah. i think you're continually researching i'm continually researching yeah. finding out more and more about our anatomy our physiology as well as all the sort of more spiritual stuff which is great yeah. as well which <laughs> resonates with me to do with symbiotic relationships and the spiritual aspect of a fruitarian diet but the science the anatomy, the biology, the mm-hmm. dietetics, and it yeah. all points to me that we are, by design, frugivores, and that our bodies are designed for a fruit diet. But you know, we've gone off the track. You know, yeah. a few few generations <laughs> down, we've gone off the track. Yeah. Uh, so, having faith is 
not blind faith it's faith built on knowledge yeah experience yeah. networking sharing with other people yeah. listening to what other people have discovered <laughs> and then you get this really solid faith in the dark and you are i am continually researching reading yeah. finding out stuff getting excited thinking yes yes that all makes <laughs> sense it all ties in with the past 30 years of what i've been reading and researching yeah and when you have that faith you are people i think react to that a lot of people say well didn't you get given a hard time doing this diet especially bringing up children and really i haven't been given you know a hard time by, by many people and i think when you have a faith in something that is built on knowledge research sharing networking people pick up on that they pick up that you've got a very solid foundation in this diet and you believe in it and they kind of I don't almost accept it. Yeah. If you're not sure about that, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know about this diet, I don't know if I really can survive on it, I don't know, I don't can I bring children up on this diet, and you're having all kinds of doubts, yeah. people will pick up on that and it will be mirrored back to you. Yeah. And if you are having doubts, you're not ready. If yeah. you're having doubts, research more, talk to more people because it has to work for you. You yeah. have to have that belief in it. And if you're not sure, do more research, look at different diets. I'm not saying this diet works for everyone. It works for me. It's worked for my children. Yeah. Um, I'm very thankful for having discovered it, but I could never say everybody needs to do this <laughs> or it, it's the perfect diet for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Everybody has to try it themselves Definitely. and you have to tweak it. And some people might need more greens. Some people might need more fat, yeah. you know, and like you, you were saying earlier about acid foods being attracted mm. to acid foods at the moment I love them <laughs> and it's also not static yeah. and Arnold Eric said the reason that most people fail on fruit diets and fasting is through individual needs not being taken into consideration yeah. and I think that is so important everybody's very different in terms of the amount of fruit they need what types of fruit mm -hmm. because we've all got different health histories yeah. we're not all the same yeah. i think if everybody was fifth or sixth generation fruit turns we might be a bit more similar <laughs> yeah. you know yeah, but we're know. not yeah. and we have individual needs and when those needs aren't listened to that's when people can fail or fall through the net yeah. and it's in in the same in terms of how many calories we need yeah because for example, if one person has had a pretty healthy childhood, they've mm. been breastfed for an extended period of time, they weren't given a lot of vaccinations, or they weren't given a lot of allopathic medications when they were a child. Mm. Growing up, they didn't take a lot of drugs, or they, again, they didn't take a lot of allopathic medicine. They ate a pretty good whole food diet. They will have a pretty good digestive system. Yeah. So the microbiome in there, as well as the villi, and the villi are the little tiny finger-like microscopic projections <laughs> yeah. in your intestines that greatly um, improve your the surface area and increase the surface area of your gut now certain things can damage the villi like mm. certain drugs certain medications and um, you know Crohn's disease things like that and so one person may have had this really good childhood and they may eat 2,000 calories a day and they may assimilate like 90% of what they're eating. Mm. Another person's had, you know, they've been bottle fed as a child. They've had a lot of um, medications, a lot of vaccinations, a lot of ear infections, antibiotics. Um, growing up, they've had Crohn's disease. They've taken recreational drugs and their villi may be damaged as well as their microbiome. Mm. And they may eat 5,000 calories a day, but only assimilate 30 or 40% of what they're eating. And so looking just at calories, just looking at macronutrients yeah. is half the equation. You've got to look at what's happening inside. Yeah. So the person that's actually eating 2000 calories is assimilating more. Yeah. But the person that's eating 5000 calories, that's a, a good amount for them. Yeah. So for one person to say you need 5000 calories, another person to say, no, you need 2000. <laughs> Both of those are correct yeah. because everybody's different, different. and assimilation mm. is a key to how much you need. Definitely. And I found for myself, when I first started out, I needed to eat quite a lot of fruit to maintain my weight. Mm -hmm. uh, I needed to eat like the denser fruits. I'd have dried fruit, avocados, sometimes nuts and seeds. And I would still, I had loads of energy, but I would need to eat a lot and a, as well as a lot of juicy fruit. Yeah. And after I did my first extended orange juice diet, which I just did to accompany a friend. So I had no expectations. <laughs> from it. I didn't think I'm doing this to get this benefit or get that benefit. I just thought, yeah, oh, yeah I'll, 
love I that. love how all of your things you're just like <laughs> joining with something and then you're like oh my gosh you yeah. just discovered something so new about yourself yeah. in that moment <laughs> and it was just like it lasted for 52 days and I always stopped because people were saying oh you're too skinny you're losing too much weight and I felt great I had yeah. loads of energy and I was stronger yeah. and had more energy than when my weight was a lot higher but anyway I did stop um but after I stopped, I found that I needed to eat so much less. And I just yeah. felt that the fruit that I was eating was doing me so much more good. Yeah. And I didn't really think so much about it at the time, apart from I need to eat less. I'm feeling the fruit's doing me a lot more good. Mm. It was just this really strong feeling I got. And then years later, I was thinking, I think I just had a big cleanse and rejuvenation of my digestive system, mm. which meant that when I was eating fruit again, I was just assimilating a lot more fruit. Yeah. So, you know, um, things can change over time. They're not static. You might need an X amount of calories at one point in your life, an X amount of fat, an X amount of greens, and that can change. Yeah. So we're all different, plus things um, change over time. I think that's, you know, really, really important. Yeah, really, really amazing mm -hmm. information. Oh, my gosh. You um, – obviously, I just – completed a, a water fast for 21 days yeah. and I actually read um, both of Arnold Eretz's books oh, wow. during that and yeah. it was funny because um, I don't know what sparked Alex was reading one of Arnold Eretz's books and then I went to go find the piece of paper that um, you had given me with the information and mm. I realized both of his books were on there yeah. I was like oh these are books that Anne recommended <laughs> yeah. but I really really resonated with a lot of the content that he had and I found it really um powerful to read in that state to really get myself mm. into a place of like yeah this is definitely what I'm wanting to continue doing mm. um and you you speaking about that um that you've just spoken it makes me think about when he talks about his like equation that chapter five he's yes. telling you to read chapter yes. five again and it's um pretty much if there's an obstruction in the yeah. way then um no matter how much like power you, yes. you give you're not going to have the vitality Yes, oh, yeah. B equals P minus O, where yes. B is vitality, P is power, and O is obstruction, yes. which is the best equation you could ever learn yeah. to teach to schools. And it's so true. Yeah. And this guy, David Shelley, who um, you know, I met when I on the, the very beginning of my journey on the fruit diet, yeah. and he had read Arnold Barrett's books and was influenced by them a lot. Yeah. And he told a story of how when he was, um, you know, before he was on the fruit diet, he was very much into exercise. And in Leicester, there's a, a hill and they called it Agony Hill because they used to <laughs> run up and run down this hill. But he said after he'd been a while on the fruit diet, he was running up and down and not getting that sort of, oh, this oh is gosh, really hard. This is hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think you you do get that, you know, on the fruitarian diet where exercise isn't as hard as it used to be and it yeah. flows. And you see people running and they're like, oh, you know, and you think, that looks painful yeah. but you've just got this flow and your muscles are going and it's just yeah. joyful and um because you're a runner aren't you you yeah, love running yeah, yeah i like running and i experienced that um for myself during my first long extended orange juice diet so i was on the island of sark which is the magical place where i'm sure if the fairies live anywhere they still live oh i've never heard it's of this gorgeous. place it's a channel island so it's between england and france yeah and they don't allow cars there. They don't have any factories. They don't have pollution. Wow. And even planes can't fly under a certain height over the island. It's, it's just a really beautiful place. What a place, place. to do your it's first gorgeous. bath. There's no crime oh there. So the second half of my orange juice diet, I was on sock. And I had to get the oranges, especially kind of oat, come over on the boat from <laughs> Guernsey. But anyway, managed to do it. Now, the year before I'd been there on a regular fruit diet. And there's a beach called La Grande Greve Beach and it's a nice beach because not many people go down to it because it's something like 360 steps there's a yeah. lot of steps okay. up there's a lot of steps down yeah and it's all right getting down but then you know getting up <laughs> there's no lift you've got again. to walk up the steps yeah so the year before the first time I tried to climb up the um the steps and I got Camlo my older son with me and I got him in a carrier and I had to stop about two or three times. Yeah. I think after the first time I could do it in one go. And the second year when I was on my orange juice diet, now I was about, and this is in pounds, I was about 28 pounds lighter, which is a couple of stone lighter. I had lost quite yeah. a lot of weight and yeah. I wasn't big to begin with. Yeah. And Camel obviously had grown. So he was like a stone heavier. <laughs> and yeah, and I thought, oh, I'll probably have to stop. And the first time I tried to go up those steps, I just went up. And it's like, wow, you know? Oh my gosh. So, it. yeah, it really, the obstructions do get removed. And yeah. 
that's why I think you can need to eat less but then that might not be the same for everyone and just because what works for one person you and always one got, day to the next yeah you've always <laughs> got to eat enough for your needs yeah. and it doesn't matter what anyone else is eating if that's working for them you've got to look at what works for you and there are times when I do eat more there's times when I have more of a hunger yeah and it depends on exercise levels as well time of the year I think in the winter yeah. you know we may need a few more calories yeah. but always just take it day to day and on an individual basis I think and you know it doesn't really matter what anyone else is doing great if that's working yeah. for them but you've got to find listen to your what own works body. for you yeah. yeah because you can listen to a thousand people yeah but your own body is your own best teacher and always will be if you can only listen to your yeah. body but yeah. we often find it hard to listen don't we yeah or we don't have faith in ourselves we think yeah. oh that person must know better because they've been doing this or that yeah but they're on their own path. And yes, we can always take advice from people and, you know, we can get tips and strategies from other people. And that's great. I mean, and I certainly learned a lot from reading Arnold yeah. Eric's books, Essie Honorable's books, Maurice Crock's book, David Shelley's book right at the beginning. And it inspired me as well. I got so enthusiastic because what they were saying made sense. And I think like, you know, saying Arnold Eric's books, I read it and it's like, this is the truth. Yeah. And yet it's simple. It's not difficult. I read a book once somebody gave me this book because they couldn't understand it. And it was written by some raw fooders and I couldn't even get past the first page. It was so complex and yeah. techy. And I just thought, uh -uh, that's this not life, really for me. This lifestyle is about simplicity. I yeah. feel at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. It's very simple. The rules are very simple. That doesn't mean it's always easy. Yeah. <laughs> so no. we like to overcomplicate things as yeah. humans don't we <laughs> yeah. but it is it's very simple the simple truths and if we stick to those simple truths we can get really great health yeah um but yeah and every time i read on order i've read his books multiple times oh, every yeah, time i, I read them I'm i get read something it. new out yes. of his books you know, and i enjoy reading them yeah, so he was a real pioneer he's so he's so clever so for context for anyone that hasn't read his books um he did a lot of experimenting on himself, which I think like really appealed to me, mm. like he, in such like a scientific way. It makes me feel like I could imagine myself as a scientist, like to experiment on myself yeah. because I feel like that's what I've done as well. Mm. But he also like, yeah, had a, what do they call it in Germany? San Sanatorium. Sanatoriums, Sanatoriums yeah. where he, people would come and fast mm. with him. And he even like trialed eating other food and then cutting mm. his arm yeah. open and seeing how quickly he healed and then eating fruit and doing the same thing and he was just yeah he's a really cool amazing very yeah pioneer definitely yes. and I think especially at that time he was around sort of like Victorian times yeah it was so it was so long ago as it well it was so out there because yes. you think everybody was in clothes and all the Victorian yeah. clothes and women weren't supposed to exercise and yes. they had to keep out of the sun they had to have parasols <laughs> on and then he's advocating being out in the sunshine sun eating naked and <laughs> not having all these constricted clothes yeah. and I think I would think it must have been really difficult to be a Victorian woman to wear corsets yeah. be kept out of the sunshine yeah and not allowed to run about and exercise yep. because it wasn't ladylike you know if you're lady no wonder and the future generations got I mean obviously they had less um preservatives and things yeah. like that than we do now but it's like each generation has like tried something new and then we've had like how many junk food gen generations now and that's like really yeah. such a big problem such a bit and even doctors even conventional allopathic doctors are saying this generation of kids aren't going to live as long as their parents and that's the first time they've said this for a while yeah and there's such a lot of health issues with children which I think um, are due to diet and a lot of allopathic mm -hmm. medical practices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know which a lot of kids they have a lot of antibiotics yeah. they have a lot of vaccinations and so many more I think when I was a kid um, I had six vaccinations yeah. or so before Minimal. I went to school yeah. I think in Australia now it's 52 and in the States Whoa. it's 72 um, and then you know like always what is that really doing in the long term it's, just, it's like always these extremes like always like oh we do this thing we'll keep doing it keep doing it until it until it doesn't work yes. anymore sort of thing and I think what is ideal for our children I mean this is obviously my personal view and I think every parent needs to make an informed decision mm. about their children mm. but I didn't have my children vaccinated and that was my decision I'm yeah. not saying that's right or wrong but that was my decision yeah. um, but my older son Camlo he was never vaccinated and he was never had any of the childhood illnesses. The same with Cappy, my younger son, he was never vaccinated, never had any of the childhood illnesses. But what was interesting with Camlo is he had some blood tests um, and that showed that he had immunity to chickenpox, which to yeah. me is the ideal immunity, better than any vaccination or anything. 
because I wanted him to have chicken pox when he was a kid. Because yeah. obviously, when you have things as a child, so anyone yeah. that had chicken pox, go and play with that exactly. over there. You know, go and stay with them. Let them breathe all over you. Yeah. And yet he never got any appreciable signs of chicken pox. Yeah. But obviously, he got natural immunity to it. And I think that is ideal. I think when we're in a healthy state, yeah. we get natural immunity without exhibiting any symptoms at all. Yeah. But when you get natural immunity to anything, whether it's measles, chicken pox, or whatever that will usually stay with you for life whereas when you're immunized against something it doesn't necessarily mean you're immune for life so yep. natural immunity where you're so healthy that you don't get any symptoms but you get a natural immunity because you've been exposed to mm -hmm. whatever yep. creates the natural antibodies and like for myself I had a blood test once and the doctor said he was very specific he said you've had a glandular fever be between two and a half, two years ago and 18 months and I've never had glandular fever and apparently due to some kind of levels of antibodies they can tell the time yeah. period and I thought well I must have come into contact with it I've never had any symptoms of glandular fever I never had swollen yeah. glands like that and it, not in that time frame not since I've been yeah. on a fruitarian diet I must have come into contact with it but got natural immunity to it yeah and I think that is ideal if we can do yeah. that I know Eric touches on some things like that too kind of kind of what I surmised from a lot of the things you were saying is like if you have the, any sort of illness or obstruction in your body and then you come into contact with like an external illness in a sense and then you catch it you only would exhibit like an issue with it if you already had illness within you to begin mm. with like mm. and I thought that was really interesting yes. and really inspired me to be like I mean, my partner and I were like, how can we be the healthiest person that we want to be? <laughs> yeah. Especially before we're like coming to conception yes. and those sorts of things. Yeah. But I wanted to take a step back for a moment, talking about that listening to um, your body aspect. I wanted to ask you if you're, because I know you've done a lot of, had a lot of experience doing orange juice mm. fasting. Orange juice is one of my favorites. Mm. So I, yeah. I could totally see that. Yeah. I was like, maybe I need to do some of this too. Do you think that the fasting helped you to, be able to listen to your body better because I feel after this second extended water fast obviously I've done a lot of juice mm. fasting as well during mm. my transition phase every time it's it's just that little bit easier mm. to listen to your body when you kind of remove so many like consumptions I guess yes I think one of the advantages of doing a lot of your water fast or a mono diet is that it simplifies your life and it frees up energy for other things. And you're not thinking, I mean, most of us, even on like a raw vegan diet, we're thinking what we're going to have for breakfast, what we're <laughs> going to have. Oh, I've got, got to go out shopping and get this and that and that. Yeah. And especially if you order boxes of oranges or you just go to your local place and they've got, you know, biodynamic organic yeah. oranges, get a couple of boxes of oranges. And I think that frees up energy on a mental and a kind of spiritual level yeah because you're not thinking uh you're not concentrating on what you're going to eat and i think by freeing that up you you have more space for other things and i think one of those things is you know listening to yourself and your needs yeah and i think that the whole fasting because you do eliminate you do um you're refining yourself to some extent i think by water fasting or going as an orange juice is quite aggressive i think some <laughs> of the other mono diets like melons like grapes i don't tend to lose weight yeah. they're not aggressive in their cleansing i don't really feel like i'm, I'm eliminating when i do those and mm. i've done six months on melon and i didn't lose any weight my weight was and i didn't eat huge amounts of melon either yeah. you know maybe three or four melons a day um, i've done papaya as well not lost weight but orange juice, like water fasting, I think is aggressive and I lose weight. Even if I eat more calories of orange juice than I do papaya or melon mm. and I don't lose weight with papaya or melon, I'll lose weight with the orange juice. And I think having that kind of elimination, it's not just a physical yeah. detox. It's a mental, oh, it's a spiritual 100%. detox. So you do, you have clearer, yeah. clearer communication with yourself because mentally, yeah. you know, your brain is just functioning so much better i think yeah it's not clogged with a lot of other stuff and it's it's just, just running know, off cleansing. the beautiful fruit sugars yes, that it needs yeah. you know and you know it's sort of like spiritually as well and so i think we can listen to ourselves we can listen to that mental part of us that spiritual part of yeah. us and our body because our body's giving us messages and one way that people can crave things is through their gut microbiome yes so if you're eating a lot of gut food uh, junk food your gut will have very different microbes into if you're eating like a whole food raw 
vegan diet mm. and those microbes want to be fed what you're eating so if you're eating junk food and all those microorganisms yeah. in your gut are associated with junk food they're going to be getting you to crave junk yes, food they remember and mm. there's this book called the liver remembers and it talks about um the concept of like the liver remembering what you've eaten mm. and so often when we get a craving for something it's maybe the liver actually mm. trying to detox that thing from our body because really interesting to say that because during my first water fast i was experiencing food like tasting doritos chips for mm. like three days i was tasting like ham pizza and i'd been vegan mm. for like five years yes, before yeah. that and whole food mainly yeah. and so to experience those foods again so heavily mm. i was like oh my gosh like something that i'm mm. like obviously eliminating or detoxing yes. as i rehydrate that but also like my body or my liver or whatever remembers that food and I could taste it. It was like I was eating it. Yes. It was so strange. And then it would pass at a certain mm. point. And it's like, okay, I've, I've urinated part of that out. The yes. rest is ready to leave me in elimination. And wow. So if people can just go through that period just rather than just through. saying, oh, well, I yeah. just need to eat this. So I just need to eat that. And I remember for me, it was about 18 months. I wasn't doing any mono diet that I can remember, but I was on a fruit diet, yeah, juicy fruit diet. And it was about 18 months after I'd started on the fruit diet. And I got this intense craving for eggs, so, so strong. And I was uh, ethically vegan. I think if I hadn't been ethically <laughs> vegan, I could have craved. I, you know, I, I could have caved. I could have eaten eggs because I just wanted eggs, scrambled eggs so, so much. Yeah. I was thinking, what's going on here? I'm not going to have eggs. And I just carried on. And then within a day and a half, it was gone and it never came back. Yeah. But it was so strong for that day and a half. And I'd never had it before, never had it afterwards. Yeah. And I thought it must be some kind of detox going on at some level. Yeah. But I didn't, I, I didn't, I think maybe I would have given into it if I hadn't been ethically vegan. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, I didn't. And uh, it went. And it was like going through that. And I think after that, I thought, well, maybe if that happens again, it will be just me detoxing something. If there was something in eggs that I really, really needed, then I wouldn't, I would crave them again. But the fact that it just went yeah, after a day and a half, it yeah. just went almost as quickly as it came on. And it was just so intense. Yes, I couldn't believe yes. how intense it was. Yeah. I just was thinking about scrambled eggs. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to have eggs. I'm vegan. <laughs> I won't have eggs. And I didn't. But the cravings were like, and that's the, the strongest craving I've ever got yeah. being on this diet. And I feel like that that's why I feel like there's a linkage between, you know, from my opinion of when you fast, you actually, you, know, you push through those experiences. Mm. And then when you start eating again, it's like you then actually have more clarity of what intuitive mm. eating mm. really is. Because if you did cave to that and it was, I mean, but who really knows mm. um, at the end of the day, yeah. but if you did cave to that and it wasn't the right thing for your body and then you ended up just having the craving for it again and then you felt like oh yeah this is the right thing yeah. for me like it's it's so tricky mm. there's such like a fine line there depending because at the end of the day if you've got obstruction and like mm. old stuff in you yes. that needs detoxing you'll always like keep probably wanting that at some stage and while you feed that you'll continue to want it yes yeah. and it is hard because a lot of people say what about cravings i don't get cravings now yeah and i think as long as i'm eating good quality fruit that's yeah. really important yeah. um because you really need to have your micronutrient needs met in this yeah. diet yeah. a lot of people talk about the macro ratios you know, 80 10 10 but i think as long as you're eating enough it's not that difficult to meet your macro needs, you yeah. know? And even if you like, you know, you think, oh, it's a bit low, but you know, an avocado has got like 300 calories or whatever. And a banana has got hundred. It's not that difficult, even just on fruit to yeah. get enough macronutrients, but the micronutrients, because the soils are depleted, mm. because the microorganisms in the soil are killed, it becomes increasingly difficult. And mm. that's what I just think it's so important. Biodynamic is really, really good. I yeah. think everything I've had that's been biodynamically grown, it's like a step above organic because wow. they really look at the soil preparation. Yeah. I've had such amazing biodynamic fruit. It's like mm. off the scale. <laughs> um, so whatever they're doing with biodynamics is working. And you can be a little bit skeptical about it, but I don't know, all the stuff I've had has been good. I remember watching a TV show about this guy. He was a British guy and he went to France to set up a biodynamic vineyard. And all the local French people were laughing at him. Oh, who's this idiot? Englishman's come over, you know, and he thinks he can do all this with biodynamics. And it was a real struggle for him because it's hard work. There's a lot mm. of soil preparations. Yeah. It was just basically him doing most of the work. 
and he also planted like a fruit and veggie garden mm. and he got really really good results it took him a couple of years i think but he got really beautiful grapes and he got this massive big you know vegetable garden really thriving and all the local people were like they weren't laughing then. They were like, oh it's great I want really good. Yeah. <laughs> so i think biodynamic is if you can get it, yeah. I'd always get, you know, if I had a choice between organic biodynamic, mm. I'd go with the biodynamic. Mm. Organic's good as well. Um, local stuff that's not sprayed can even be better than organic sometimes. If it's yeah. just somebody growing it locally on a small scale, yeah. they don't spray. Uh, because organic is sprayed, but with, you know, acceptable sprays yeah. for organic farming. Uh, wild, foraged f- fruit is so important. Yeah. But you have to know what you're doing. So get a guidebook. Um, don't eat anything if you're not sure what it is because not all fruit is edible for humans Mm. because we're not the center of the universe (laughs) we share the universe with other animals and some animals are better at spreading seeds for certain Mm. fruits yes i'm glad we're talking about this (laughs) yeah most of the toxic fruits that can be quite deadly to humans are small berries Mm. And it is advantageous for small berries to be eaten by birds because birds can fly huge distances mm-hmm. and they're more effective at spreading the seeds. And here are the kookaburras. I don't know if they're, <laughs> they're, they're agreeing in the background anyway. So the berries are often, if it's a poisonous fruit, it will be a berry. Yeah. Because everything in nature makes sense. So if it's more advantageous t- for a plant to have its fruit spread by birds Mm -hmm. what if it makes that fruit toxic to mammals Mm. then they're not going to eat it and the birds will eat it it's not toxic to the birds yeah and they'll spread it and similarly some fruits when they're not properly ripe are toxic Mm -hmm. Um, astringent persimmon Mm -hmm. and um, chocolate sapoti which are related they're in the same um, Mm, deaspirus family Mm. yeah both of them (laughs) if they're unripe have got a lot of tannins in and are quite toxic. Yeah. And I think even in the Philippines, they use unripe um, chocolate sapoti as a, some kind of poison for fish, which isn't very nice, but it's very toxic. I don't think yeah. it'll kill you, but if you've ever tried it, it's like... Yeah, when you taste the disgusting. tannins, like you yeah. taste so gross, you want to spit yes. it out. Yeah. Um, and ackee is a gorgeous fruit. Ackee is the national fruit of Jamaica. It's like cream cheese, but it's delicious. Mm. But when it's not properly ripe, it can actually kill you. Yeah, wow. Um, I think 23 people died over a three month period in Jamaica and it's their national fruit for eating underripe ackee. Yeah. But once it's ripe, it's perfectly okay. And again, it's nature making sense because the fruit plant puts a lot of effort into creating the seeds and the fruit in order that that you take it away and you spread the seeds. Now, if you come and eat that fruit before it's properly ripe, the seeds might not be viable. It's Mm -hmm. wasted all that energy. Mm -hmm. But if it makes its fruit toxic or taste horrible (laughs) before it's properly ripe, then you're not going to eat that fruit in its unripe state. You're going to know. If you see people being sick when they're eating underripe ackee or underripe chocolate sapoti, you're going to wait until it's ripe. So everything makes sense at some level. So foraging is great and it's good fun and children love it yeah and i think it's because it goes back to our primal nature we yeah. are foragers we're fruit foragers that's how we would have lived we couldn't just go down to the organic store we couldn't just <laughs> go to coles or woolies yeah we'd have to forage our food and if we didn't like foraging fruit we'd have all died out so there's that it doesn't just feed us physically foraging mm. it feeds us on a spiritual and emotional and mental level yeah and that's why i think kids love it my kids have some of the best times my kids have been foraging fruit yeah you know i remember being in portugal with my older boy and we were at cordoba botanical gardens and these ripe persimmon ripe on the tree and he was climbing up picking them and then when we were in portugal he got guavas and avocados ripe avocados under the tree that had fallen off and ripened and cappy as well like you know anywhere where there's fruit he'll find it he's, yeah. like, he's got the fruit radar i'll miss it if you take on a walk for him he'll say oh look at that look at that and he'll find any kind of fruit yeah. and also he enjoys like bush tucker yeah. fruits which yeah. a lot of older people don't i think because we've got our taste buds accustomed to typical mm-hmm. cultivated fruit yeah and an interesting story is we went for a picnic once in brisbane met up with a friend went to um west end markets and at that point there were two really nice stalls at west end markets with really good organic fruit and bought loads of really nice organic fruit thought this is going to be cap is going to be so excited we've got all this fruit for the picnic 
went to um, South Bank, set out the picnic rugs, put all this organic fruit and thinking, where's Cappy? <laughs> Cappy's off. He's under this Morton Bay fig tree. Oh my gosh, Morton I was Bay. waiting for the figs. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, they're not jammy. They're not commercial Mediterranean oh, wow. figs. They're dry and mealy, but they do taste like figs. Yeah. He'd never had them before. Nobody would said to him, hey, Morton Bay figs are extremely good for calcium and other <laughs> sort of micronutrients. It was like, he knew yeah and he was just going off he'd bring each one to me to make sure there's no insects in it it was fine i checked and then he'd eat it and he's looking at this little kid scrabbling about and this <laughs> beautiful old morton bay fig tree oh my gosh. and um that really made me think that was one of these things in your life that really makes you think i thought if a child is brought up on a uh, fruitarian diet they develop really good instincts for mm. what fruit mm. is most beneficial. Yeah. Um, and even though um, they'll teach us dry, <laughs> mealy figs, they're not like jammy figs. Yeah. He was preferring to eat them to all the lovely, you know, what I thought lovely, this lovely organic fruit picnic. He ignored it. <laughs> yeah. So I think our instincts, the more, the longer we're on this diet, I think, and the, you know, if we do cleansing and stuff, our instincts do. We do get that instinct, yeah. but I think with a child that's always been brought up on this diet, you really they, see, yeah. It. yeah. And he likes a lot of um, bush tucker fruits that most people find sour. Like you know, he'll eat blue quandong, which grow around here, and uh, I can eat maybe one. I think it's like, oh, it's a bit sour. And lily pillies, he'll eat loads of lily pillies. Oh my gosh, you should have to come to my parents' house. <laughs> my parents ha have like a giant lily pilly tree yeah. in the backyard, yeah, and we we never ate them. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, and the little sort of um, wild cherry things you get that are like kind of quite tart. Again, yeah. he's got that taste for more tart, mm. more bush tucker um, cool. foods, which I think is interesting. Um, yeah. You know, and even even myself, who's been on this diet a long time, I haven't got that same taste for them that he has. But then I've been brought up on very different foods. But yeah, yeah, interesting. I love you mentioning that symbiotic relationship of the, between the mammals and the birds and the fruit trees mm. and the way that that spreading of seeds mm. and something that really struck to me that you have said to me previously was that you it's important for us to spread the seeds of our mm. fruit obviously mm. more so if it's organic and biodynamic yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then we're giving them back to the earth and then yeah. we create this um this continuous symbiotic yeah. relationship with really loving our planet mm. by doing doing our part when we are eating this and it's one of those foods that you can do that with yeah it's it's really the only food that you can is the exactly. fruit and the fruit um i think um victorious corvinasus or whatever i don't know if i've got his name right but <laughs> survival in the 21st century he put about how fruit is the only karma free food and i think david wolf as well put that in um, yeah. you know one of his books and it is karma free in that the plant wants us to eat the fruit yeah the plant doesn't want us to eat its leaves or its roots because if we le eat its leaves we'll be taking away its photosynthesis capacity to some extent and if we take too many leaves we'll be kill it you know yeah. if we dig up a plant for its roots yes sure we we kill it whereas a plant actually wants us to eat the fruit yeah because plants are static you know, unless you've got triffids, which hopefully we haven't got triffids, which were, you know, moving around and terrorizing people. But um, plants are static, which brings up a huge problem for them of how to spread their fertilized seeds yeah. because they can't move and they don't want the seeds growing under the parent plant because they'll be competing for light, for mm -hmm. space, for nutrients in the soil. Yeah. So they want the seeds spread and they have to look at how, how are they going to get the seeds spread? And one method is um, wind. But that only works for really light seeds, mm. like a sycamore seed or Not a dandelion. Not for a mango. Yeah, <laughs> just sort of like you need a cyclone you know, <laughs> to move a mango seed. Uh, and another method is water, so coconuts. And that's why we see yeah. coconuts growing by the side of the sea a lot of the time, because that's how the seeds spread. So mm. if a coconut is left to go fully mature, the, the coconut will drop off, it will float in the in the see and it will be deposited somewhere away from the parent plant where eventually it will sprout and it will grow mm -hmm. and when we take off immature um, coconuts for young coconuts which I do like young coconuts but mm -hmm. we kind of break that because yeah. we're taking ideally in the whole um, you know scheme of things the coconuts are left till they're fully mature and then they fall down and they'll go in the, the water and then the third method is by animals and mm. one method is like 
on animals' coats. Mm. So things like bindies or burrs, they're very sticky, very prickly. So an animal will go past yeah. and the seeds will stick to their coat. And it's a very, very effective method of transferring mm. seeds from one area to another. And the guy who invented Velcro did so because he saw a burr stuck on his dog's coat. So and cool. he thought, huh, that, well, that works well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, Velcro was invented. And then, of course, the other method is by animals either ingesting yeah. the whole fruit and something like tomatoes or passion fruit where the seeds are small and then going and, you know, having a bowel movement and depositing the seeds <laughs> ready fertilized or with a bigger fruit, such yeah. as an avocado or a mango, taking the fruit away eating it and then depositing just throwing the seed away yeah now we're not advocating for going and pooing in your backyard but <laughs> but if you've got avocado seeds and whatever you can like yeah putting yeah. them in the garden or putting mm. them in the forest near you or wherever you, yeah. you can is a really really cool I've seen that. yeah, yeah and, it's super and, cool and i think you know it's welching on the deal we're getting the food if we don't plant the seeds in return we're kind of yeah. welching on that deal like and giving so, and receiving yeah and if, if we can't plant them all if we just if we go out somewhere and we throw it in a bush who knows like 20 years later somebody else might be coming past <laughs> and they might say oh look there's a mango I pick, I pick a right mango because yeah. we've thrown that seed in a bush you know 20 years before so it's thinking of the future and i think one of the huge issues at the moment mm. with the world and why we can be in trouble ecologically and environmentally is because humans have been living in a parasitic relationship yeah. with the planet and we've been taking we've been taking we've been taking and we've not been giving back or mm. we've not been giving back enough yeah. And so everything gets out of balance. But when we live in a more symbiotic way and tree planting is just one of the best ways, yeah. it's one of the best ways to heal the planet because just one mature fruit tree in your garden will offset a car being driven 26,000 miles in terms of carbon. Wow. And two um, mature fruit trees will produce enough oxygen for a family of four. So planting trees means that, um, pollutants will be absorbed and not just carbon dioxide so trees store carbon their, their carbon stores they're taking a lot of carbon dioxide and they give that oxygen which is just what we need at the moment because we're going the other way yeah. um, and the thing as well with composting because if we put our scraps in landfill some people say oh well it's good because they're organic matter it's good to have some organic matter in landfill mm -hmm. no it's not because they can't break down and then they aerobically yeah. they break down anaerobically without oxygen which causes the release of methane which is seven times more destructive than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse wow. gas yeah. so when we put fruit scraps in landfill it's almost worse in a way than some of the other stuff that goes in landfill because of the way it breaks down when we mm -hmm. compost it the opposite happens yes. and there's more and more community composting in cities like brisbane there's a lot of community gardens where you can take your compost yeah. in big cities they even have you know schemes that take restaurant waste That's and awesome. then they produce compost and then they grow food that the restaurant yeah. can use so it's a whole you know sort of like the chain of yes, yeah. it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> and so no tree planting is it's just brilliant and um, i think it's important to be positive because we can you know we can look at all the things that are going on in the world and get a yeah. little bit depressed about it or negative and think you know how can we do anything but by planting trees a simple act of just planting a few trees if we haven't got a garden we can plant them on somebody else's garden or there's places you can go and you can plant trees yeah. um, if you haven't got the space you can pay and they'll plant the fruit tree for yeah, you which yeah. is really nice yeah. and and then we just and i went to one, a fruit festival in the uk one mm. year and there was this indian guy and he had planted like hundreds of thousands his organization wow. of trees and i'm thinking wow it's so positive we don't hear those stories on the yeah, news yeah. we just hear the doom and gloom but mm. there are people doing that and it yeah. just gives me faith in humanity and i think yes yeah. you know there are people that care deeply about this planet yeah. and are doing things to try and get that symbiotic relationship back into effect rather than this kind of parasitic relationship we've had for the past couple of hundred years really yeah on the planet so yeah how has your spirituality changed through switching to fruit and your earth by fasting experiences i think one way is connection with plants and trees yeah i think before when i became vegan it was through uh, having a connection with animals yeah connecting with animals and realizing that i couldn't eat animals anymore and i couldn't eat animal um, products whereby they've been cruelty 
um, and animals can find in factory farms, like with the, the dairy industry and with um, eggs. And so I made that connection with animals, but I never made it with plants. Yeah. But when I started getting to the fruitarian diet and looking at how plants really want us to eat their fruit and how they <laughs> provide, and it's just such a gift, they provide yeah. this fruit for us. When I um, got into the fruit diet, I just felt a connection between plants that I hadn't felt before. And if I was out and I was thinking, these plants are living sentient creatures. And yes, they don't have the same central nervous system as animals. They're different. And we're very human centric. So, you know, a lot of people think you're crazy when you say, yes, I do believe that plants have feelings. I do believe that plants are sentient creatures. But yes, they're not like us because they're plants and we're animals. Yeah. And we put certain values on other animals and anim mammals as well. A lot of people will value mammals above insects because we relate to them more because we are mammals, which, yeah. you know, you can understand. And plants are different again. But then drawing the line between animals and plants and animals being more valuable, that's not always the case. I think a lot of people would be more upset seeing a beautiful old 200-year tree being cut down than seeing a little ant squashed. Mm. so there's not mm -hmm. always that clear divide animals have more value than humans and i think when we become aware of this symbiotic relationship when we become aware that everything's connected plants animals even rocks everything's connected on this planet yeah and everything you know um has its own consciousness then it opens up a whole new world you can be walking down the street and saying oh, thinking looking at a tree and seeing it in a whole different way yeah so i think for me that was a really big thing well wow. and also another big thing that came about not so much to do with a vegan diet but more when i got onto a fruitarian diet was that taking responsibility for my own health and that is so empowering not just on a physical level but at a spiritual and mental level because you realize that if you get sick you're in control of that and it's nobody else to blame even though obviously genetics has a part yeah. we are limited to some extent about what our parents did what our grandparents did but I don't have control over that but I do have control over what I eat what I think mm -hmm. um, if I exercise if I deep breathe all these things that we do have control over and it mm -hmm. gives us a tremendous amount of power and I think especially at the moment when people are being disempowered they're being told unless you do this unless you do that mm -hmm. you know and there's this fear that they're going to have you know some health crisis when really the best thing we can do is to look after ourselves. It's not just about diet. It's about a lot of other things, relationships with people, fresh air, sunshine, mm. positive thoughts. Our immune systems will become very strong yeah. and they will resist infections and viruses. And one thing, talking about orange juice again, is that orange juice has been shown by scientific studies to help protect us against respiratory viruses. So at this time, we should all be drinking fresh orange juice. But everyone, orange juice fast from fresh tomorrow. Orange juice, yes. <laughs> and, but nobody's saying this. No governments yeah. are saying to people, stop smoking, eat more organic foods, reduce yeah. chemicals, have vitamin C rich foods, which has been shown time and time again to protect us against respiratory viruses yeah. and viruses in general. We're not being given even things that we can do we'll be told what we can't do we can't hug people we can't breathe freely we yeah. can't do this and that we're not being told what we can do and I think governments have, have really fallen short in not telling us all the things we can do to improve our health mm -hmm. to resist illness all sorts of illnesses and to keep well and then we can let go of this kind of fear a lot of people are really sad now they're in so much fear yeah um and they think that they haven't got control over their health when they have. Yeah. And they give this control away to governments, to doctors and nurses when it's their own body mm -hmm. that they should be giving the control to. Yeah. yeah. The divine intelligence of the human body yeah. is bigger than we can even comprehend most of the time. Yes. And only when we really start to experience it do we really understand that mm. to a degree. Yes. <laughs> I feel like I'm still learning that, yes. you know. And the whole of life's a learning journey. Everybody's yeah. learning. No, we, we realise the more we learn... We realize how little we learn. Yeah. But I think, you know, we can take the simple things, the simple truths of this diet and the fact that symbiotic relationships make the world go around. Love makes the world go around. The lightness will always defeat the darkness. And we yeah. can take those very simple things that aren't difficult to understand and apply them to any situation, any situation where we're struggling, when we're feeling overwhelmed mm. we realize that the lightness also overcomes the darkness yeah. and that we are in control of our own health 
and we don't have to do everything at once we can take baby steps yeah just eating one extra piece of fruit a day can make a huge difference in your health with this these school kids they got one class and this was in the uk several years ago and one class instead of having um some crisps or some sweets at break they had a piece of fruit the rest of the day they ate exactly the same so all of the meals it was just their morning break they had fruit and they noticed that the um the performance academically of these children was really enhanced and their behavior was enhanced. Mm. So just by adding fruit to the diet can improve, you know, the way we feel, the yeah. way our brain works. We yeah. don't have to necessarily be 100% fruitarian. Yeah. Um, you know, it's baby steps along the way. Even if you just eat more fruit and try and get organic or non-sprayed or biodynamic fruit so you're not adding more toxins into your body and, yeah. you know, just little things that we can can really make a difference, you know? Yeah, I think that's really, really yeah. powerful. And also remembering, like, if you have a lot of obstruction and toxins within, the, yes. the fruit's going to help that to be eliminated. Mm. So you don't always feel that great sometimes yeah. when you, oh, hello, when you eat the fruit, we got a little bird coming we to join in the podcast. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you're in the way. Yeah. Um, oh, he's back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I think we might um, finish off with some, I've got some questions for you. Do you Thank you. Yeah. Questions. Do you know, what's your star sign and do you know your moon and rising sign? I'm Virgo yes. and I'm a fire horse in the Chinese horoscope, Ooh, nice. which means you're quite dangerous as a female. Apparently in China. <laughs> I'm a fire horse too. Are you really? Yeah, I just it, realized. Oh, wow. They used to put the fire horses down in China. Somebody oh told me gosh. this man who's a fire horse said if you were born in China years ago, that only the females, because they were too much trouble and too oh, feisty and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I don't know my rising signs. So I think maybe Leo, but I'm not sure. Yeah, but yeah I could imagine Leo. Virgo. You've got the, the mane going on with the Leo. <laughs> rising yeah. do you know what your moon sign is no I don't. Uh, we'll have to look it up yeah. after but i'm virgo and high horse that's mm, why nice yeah. what's your favorite fu- fruit shante melon Ooh. which is a really delicious i think it's been around for at least 400 years yes um french melon yeah and whenever I'm, I'm in europe or in the states they do grow them in the states so i try and get them i um, can't get them here in australia can't get them here. i've tried to grow them yeah you can grow them down south but it's too humid here in yeah. I've, but i have got a greenhouse now oh. so this kind of you know i probably need to start sowing them in a couple of months um yeah i might try them Ooh. in the greenhouse because that would c- sort of like control the humidity a little bit yeah but they're delicious they're so fragrant if you have a bowl of shantae melons they will fragrance the whole room. You don't need air freshness. They're, they're just really lovely. Oh, I would love yeah. to try some. Yeah. If you could return to one moment in your life and experience it again, what would that be? Um, I think it might be spending some time with my mum who's yeah. passed because I miss my mum. She was such a beautiful soul. She really helped set me up for my life because she was very non-judgmental. Yeah. So she, it meant that I could do things that were kind of a bit outside the norm. So I think spending some time on holiday with my mum yeah that would be beautiful yeah yoga or pilates yoga yeah what plant or flower do you like to work with the most sunflowers sunflowers (laughs) i love it do you have a favorite crystal um i like amethyst i think Mm, yeah a lot but i think i like um and also rose quartz yeah rose quartz yeah both of those i mean (laughs) i think how can they not be most people's favorites and what would you say that your spirit animal is um probably a fruit bat <laughs> <laughs> i was going to introduce you as a fruit bat at the probably start bat because they're just so cute and when i see yeah. them I just, oh you know little darlings and i remember watching this program it's an american program about the fruit bats in australia and they had a group of them and their little faces are so cute and foxy and the man said oh look at those fruit bats with their sinister little faces <laughs> sinister little faces they're so cute oh, so yeah. yeah i like fruit bats oh yeah. i love that well i think we'll wrap it up there thank you so so much and it's been such a pleasure and there was probably even things that i didn't even get to ask you so maybe you'll have to come back on in the future if you would like to well thank you for inviting me it's been <laughs> lovely having a chat and sharing and um thank you for your lovely interview thank you